Okay. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Oxford, uh, Dr. Lavino Grichetti, pronouncing the surname, who is currently director at the Research Institute of Development and European Affairs, also known as Vidaya in, in Pristina, as well as assistant uh, professor of political science at the Faculty of Political Science at the EDP in Pristina. And he has also served as a researcher at various academic institutions, including the University of Amsterdam, the University of Manchester. He was here as a visiting researcher. And uh, he has served and continues to serve as a consultant to European and international agencies on matters related to Kosovo and the, the Western Balkans. And we've had CSOPs as an entity and a number of us individually uh, um, interaction with Nagano uh, and with Videya having taken part in excellent uh, conferences which Videya has organized in Pristina. Uh, so uh, we keep the track record. History uh, there and, and CSOPs as well. Uh, and to uh, serve as discussant, we're absolutely delighted to have with us as well. You see on the screen uh, Dr. Melina Bidini, um, who's a uh, researcher, lecturer, and currently uh, head of the department of humanities and communication at the European University of Tirana in in Albania and has also spent time at Oxford as an academic visitor at uh, St. Anthony. So absolutely delighted um, um, that Bellini is able to join us today. And we're um, we're here really to um, celebrate and discuss uh, Ladinov's uh, book, which has been published just this year, titled The EU as a State Builder. In international affairs, the case of possible published by by Routledge. And um, obviously, uh, state building has been an extremely important, very prominent aspect of the international community's engagement uh, in I'm sorry about that. It's just there were three online audiences complaining about the the volume. You're, you're, you're achieving results and I don't think anybody else in this room would be able to achieve, so you should be apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to continue with that? Or we still have sound in the back? Um, can you hear us, Benina? You can hear us, but we can't hear you again, okay? Can we, can we, I can hear you. Oh, you yeah. can hear you. Okay. Okay. And the participants, the attendees? This, one of them has complained, but um, if Belina can hear us, then it might be a okay. individual thing. Anyway, I'll just continue to say that um, within the international community, obviously, the European Union has been one of the most uh, prominent players. And um, I think what's uh, a real achievement about this book is that it offers a very comprehensive look at the work of the EU as a as a stakeholder in Kosovo. And um, when I say stakeholder, I think um, it's important to unpack that uh, term. And I think this is what uh, Madame does so, so well by looking at the EU's contributions in uh, building institutions and in um, enhancing the, the capacities of, uh, of Kosovo, especially at the governmental level. But also, very importantly, the contribution that uh, the EU has made um, in, in terms of normal developments in uh, Kosovo. So it's not 
uh, just from a technical standpoint, but the norms that are underpinning uh, these, these institutions. And I'd say these are the more than two aspects that uh, uh, he will explain not only in more detail, but probably more accurately uh, the content of, of this book, but just to say that it's a very useful contribution to the uh, literature, and we're again very pleased to have you with us today. So, over to you. Thank you. Uh, in fact, thank you for organizing this uh, event and uh, for such a good uh, introduction that uh, you made. Uh, so basically, uh, today I'm going to uh, briefly talk about the role of the EU as a state builder uh, in international affairs with uh, a specific view on Kosovo's case, but I will also look uh, onto the role of other international actors which were involved in Kosovo from 1999 till uh, 2020 or 21. Uh, basically, when we talk about um, uh, the role of EU in uh, Kosovo, we also need first to uh, look at the role of the EU in the entire Western world. Uh, so, well, if you can change this, yeah. um, my book first discusses as um, uh, background the role of uh, EU in different countries of the. Western Balkans, but not uh, only the role of the EU, but also the role of other international actors which are involved in the Western Balkans. As to the EU, uh, it is important to, to highlight the accession status of uh, Western Balkan countries, uh, uh, in particular uh, to mention the uh, status of, of Kosovo as a potential candidate country and also the role of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which remains uh, still as a, a potential candidate, whereas we have uh, four other countries, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, which uh, opened uh, negotiations and are continuing negotiations with the EU, whereas in the case of uh, North Macedonia and Albania, we do have uh, a stalemate there due to the veto from uh, Bulgaria in opening uh, negotiations between uh, both countries and the uh, European Union. So uh, this uh, uh, landscape or picture remains uh, as uh, uh, the time being as well. Uh, on the other hand, on setting the scene within the book, I also look at the role of uh, other international actors present in the Western Balkans. Uh, when I say the role of other international Balkans, uh, of the other international actors in the Western Balkans, I have in mind here, in particular, three other international actors, if I may name or dab those actors like that. First, Russia, second, China, and third, Turkey. So, uh, as it comes to the uh, China and Russia, uh, we can uh, say that both those actors are involved in political and economic terms. For instance, uh, Russia is involved uh, in the Western Balkans, in particular in Serbia and uh, Republic of Serbia, between Bosnia and Herzegovina. On the other hand, China is involved with its economic projects. In particular, uh, we can mention here uh, Belt and Road project, which is the uh, infrastructure project, which uh, goes for the, uh, uh, in the countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, in the case of Russia, we have also a type of humanitarian base in Serbia, but uh, which in particular uh, is a type of uh, military base uh, uh, in, uh, in Serbia. And uh, the influence of, of Russia uh, in the case of uh, Republic of Serbia in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is uh, quite special due to the relations between the leader of Republika Srpska, Milorad Dodik, with uh, uh, Russia's president, uh, Vladimir uh, Putin. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we do have also the uh, NATO and the EU. So, uh, for instance, if uh, in the last 20 or 21 years since the Saloniki summit, there was no enlargement uh, 
contact with uh, Western Balkan countries uh, on the European Union level, there was enlargement of NATO with some of the Western Balkan countries. So uh, with the leadership of United States, uh, Albania first, uh, and also Croatia at the same time, and then uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia joined NATO. Kosovo is willing to join NATO, but due to the uh, non-recognition by four member states of NATO, is not eligible to uh, join NATO. Serbia is unwilling to join NATO, and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, partially willing to join NATO because the uh, uh, Muslim and Croatian Federation is willing to join NATO, whereas Republika Srpska is not willing to uh, uh, join NATO. So basically, this is the, uh, the current landscape uh, at the uh, level of uh, Western Balkans. And uh, when it comes to the uh, case of Kosovo, I think that uh, a British scholar, uh, Noel Malcolm, was uh, quite right that uh, he said that uh, everything started in Kosovo, the collapse of the uh, former Republic of Yugoslavia, and it will end up in uh, uh, Kosovo. So uh, basically what we see uh, from the uh, recent developments in the last decade, of course, and uh, also uh, during the few last years, uh, the collapse of former Yugoslavia, it, will, uh, it, it has ended in a way, but now uh, for the final act, we will need to have a final deal between Kosovo and Serbia in order to uh, summarize and uh, close this uh, chapter, uh, which was a tragic chapter of uh, uh, the Western Balkans and eventually move the region towards uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, integrations, which means also more uh, peaceful relations between countries and uh, more prosperous uh, life for the citizens of the uh, entire Western Balkans. If you can move to three slides. Okay, so uh, now to provide you with uh, some uh, uh, background and uh, uh, book uh, methodology, basically. Uh, I'm conducting research on this topic since 2006, and uh, uh, I have conducted research on this topic uh, in various institutions. So uh, as uh, uh, Professor Tafton mentioned uh, some of them. I also conducted field work in different parts of uh, Kosovo, but also in different parts of Europe. So I conducted daily interviews uh, in Pristina, Mitrovica, and other parts of Kosovo, but at the same time, I conducted elite interviews in Berlin, Germany, Brussels uh, uh, several times. So uh, I have interviewed various groups of uh, people, including the local and international uh, officials and uh, uh, members of civil society, academia, media, and also international officials who work for different international organizations in, uh, in Kosovo. So basically, the data collection spans uh, uh, is from 2006, when I continued in 2009, 10, uh, 19, and 2020 and uh, uh, 21, when I uh, um, finished my uh, my research uh, uh, in this uh, topic, which culminated in the publication of this uh, book. Uh, it is important for the follow-up uh, uh, information and uh, uh, structure that I will provide to uh, illustrate or to inform you about the uh, way how I define success and failure in the book. So uh, basically, uh, failure is equal to number one, uh, limited success. Number two, relative success or mixed results. Number three, and substantial success. Number four, and complete success. Number five. Certainly, those uh, categories were also used or applied during my elite interview. So, when I uh, uh, interviewed various groups of people for my research, I also asked them uh, in line with these categories that I had uh, predefined uh, regarding my, uh, uh, my book. So uh, when I say in the following slide that EU, for instance, was uh, 
limited successful in this and that, this means that uh, it was not that successful. It was uh, more linked with failure. Or when I say substantial success, it means that it was near to uh, reach complete success on uh, one of the issues that I addressed in the book. Now, something related to the uh, theories. Um, so uh, regarding uh, theories, uh, I do combine in the book uh, two types of theories. Uh, the first one uh, is liberal peace thesis or liberal peace approach. And the second one is uh, normative power euro. Uh, the first one, liberal peace approach, uh, I use it due to the fact that uh, most of the state building missions uh, uh, in different parts of the world are being analyzed with the liberal peace approach. And of course, we do have also the critique towards this uh, perspective. On the other hand, I use normative power Europe due to the fact that the main aim or goal of the study is to analyze the role of the uh, EU in the process of uh, state building in uh, Kosovo. So uh, in this context, I do combine the feature or elements of both uh, perspectives. Uh, for instance, um, based on the liberal peace approach, uh, I have generated three main features that uh, are being uh, promoted by the scholars of this approach. The first one is immediate economic reconstruction and establishing free market economy in the case where state building mission takes place. Uh, the second feature is institution building. And the third feature uh, is related to ethnic accommodation via the principle of multi-ethnicity. So basically, wherever the state building mission takes place, uh, the intention by the uh, international community is to build up uh, institutions which are in line with the multi ethnicity principle. In other words, with the consociational model which has been promoted by uh, Arendt Liebhardt and uh, other scholars uh, uh, who are relevant in this field. On the other hand, with the normative power Europe, we do have five core norms. Uh, the first one is sustainable peace, freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. So basically, there is a linkage. There are links between those five norms and also those three features or elements that I have highlighted uh, within the uh, liberal peace uh, approach. So uh, I merge those features uh, together and I analyze systematically uh, the three aspects which are defined concretely. Uh, in the following uh, the following minutes, which I will uh, highlight or underline. At the same time, uh, I do use two types of mechanisms for diffusion of norms uh, from the international community in general and from the EU in particular. Those types of mechanisms are overt and transference diffusion. Uh, overt diffusion, uh, Re related to my book means political or physical presence of the international actors in the case where state building process takes place. On the other hand, transference diffusion means, diffusion means uh, technical assistance and funding provided by the EU in this case, but also other international actors uh, regarding the uh, case of Kosovo. So basically uh, those types of diffusion mechanisms are also applicable or used in both theories, uh, in liberal peace approach and also normative uh, power Europe. So uh, basically uh, I use the, the same types of uh, mechanisms for the uh, diffusion of norms and uh, uh, other relevant inputs by uh, various international actors, but in particular by the EU. Next slide, please. I look within the book uh, at two complementary spaces. 
the first one is 1999 till 2008, which means still the Kosovo declaration of independence. And the second stage from 2008 till the end of 2020, uh, which uh, covered the post independence period until the uh, end of uh, 2020. Uh, within the first period, 1999 to 2008, I look both at tangible and normative impact. Now, let me clarify what do I mean by tangible and normative impact. Uh, tangible impact uh, means when there is a government in place, when the economic reconstruction has been completed, when the free market economy has been established, and when the necessary legal and constitutional framework exists within the uh, country. On the other hand, normative impact is related to the change of human behavior, emancipation of citizens and also officials within the uh, institution and government where the uh, process of diffusion of both norms takes place uh, uh, during the international state building mission. In my book, in the case of Kosovo, uh, at the first stage, 1999-2008, I cover both tangible and normative impact. On the other hand, from 2008 till 2020, I do cover only normative impact. Now you may raise the question why. The answer is that uh, normative impact, uh, impact, tangible impact has been completed until the declaration of independence. Because uh, in 2008, we had a representative government in Kosovo, uh, economic reconstruction was uh, uh, completed, and also uh, we had the necessary mechanisms and legislative framework for the uh, operation of the free market. Uh, uh, economy and the same could be applied also regarding the uh, legislative and constitutional framework uh, in relation to ethnic accommodation via a principle of uh, multi ethnicity. At the same time, uh, except looking at the tangible and normative impact, I also do look at the key uh, versus assistant role of various international actors present in uh, Kosovo. In other words, I do distinguish uh, the role of the EU via overt and transparent diffusion that I explained previously. And I also do distinguish the role of UN, OSCE, and other international actors via overt and transparent diffusion in two separated uh, periods. So, first one, 99 till 2008, and the second one, 2008 until uh, 2020. Next slide, please. So, uh, regarding the, um, the results, what type of results we do generate? within this uh, uh, two complementary periods. As to the first period, 1999-2008, uh, we can say that EU and other international actors reached substantial success regarding tangible impact in the process of state building in Kosovo. On the other hand, EU and other international actors reached relative success or mixed results regarding diffusion of normative impact in Kosovo. Always I'm talking about the first period, 1999 to uh, 2008. For this period, EU was found out to be the key actor via transferring diffusion, so via funding and technical assistance, EU was the key actor in Kosovo from 1999 till 2008. On the other hand, via political role or over diffusion, other international actors play the 
main role in Kosovo in the process of state building. And when I say other international actors, here I have in mind Kuwait, which was an entity uh, which was established uh, basically as part of contact group uh, um, in the crisis of uh, former Yugoslavia, but Quint in Kosovo was constituted from United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Italy. So basically, Quint as an entity had the main or key role via political uh, tools or via all diffusion in the process of state building in Kosovo from 1999 till 2008. That's what I uh, generate uh, in my study, in my, in my book. Uh, on the other hand, regarding the second stage, 2008 uh, till 2020, as I said, uh, we look only at normative impact for this uh, uh, period. And at the same time, we distinguish again uh, between uh, key versus assistant actors uh, in the uh, process of uh, state building uh, in uh, Kosovo. At the same time, uh, for this period, I do look at the role of the EU in facilitating the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia since March 2011. Since March 2011, there is a complementary feature or element within the analytical framework, which has to do with the role of the EU as a facilitator in the dialogue process between Kosovo and uh, Serbia. And at the same time, this is also being used as a complementary tool by the European Union in the norm diffusion process, so not only in Kosovo, but also in Serbia. So through this process, the EU was aiming to transform, you know, the mindset in a way in both countries. So in Kosovo and in Serbia. In this respect, um, I need to uh, illustrate uh, the way how EU has operated regarding the, uh, the dialogue, because I think it's important for the uh, follow-up results and findings. Um, uh, this has to do with the EU's uh, constructive ambiguity, so the principle of uh, constructive ambiguity. Uh, for instance, uh, let me uh, mention here that uh, uh, more than 30 technical agreements were reached within the framework of new facilitated dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. When I say technical uh, agreements, those agreements had to do with uh, issues such as uh, telecommunication, energy, then establishing the association of uh, uh, third majority municipalities. Uh, uh, in Kosovo, then issues of accepting and recognizing IDs uh, of uh, uh, both countries and other related um, uh, related agreements. Um, here uh, in the book, I do mention several uh, such agreements, but uh, let me illustrate with uh, two uh, agreements the constructive ambiguity of the EU. For instance, regarding the uh, agreement on association of Serb majority municipalities in Kosovo, in order to make happy both sides, Kosovo and Serbia, EU used two different terms or denominators for the same agreement. So it has used association slash community. So it has used association in order to make happy Kosovo government, which would say that this is simply an association, a type of non-governmental organization. On the other hand, it has used community in order to make happy Serbian government, which would say that this is not a non-governmental organization, but this is a type of 
political entity which would create the uh, third level of uh, uh, power in Kosovo because we have local and national level of uh, governance in Kosovo. So this could be like a regional level of, uh, of power. So this is a constructive ambiguity of the EU in practice. Another agreement in which EU has used, again, same principle is the integrated border management between Kosovo and Serbia. Again, here we have two terms, border and boundary. You draw the difference, so I don't need to uh, explain that. Uh, in other words, again, to make happy both governments of Kosovo and Serbia, again, constructive ambiguity in practice. And uh, also uh, other agreements uh, that I do mention in, in the book who were uh, associated with uh, this type of uh, constructive ambiguity. But this was effective in reaching agreement. But when it comes to implementing agreement in practice, it has created plenty of problems and challenges because this would create that opportunity for both sides to interpret those agreements in different ways or uh, different uh, uh, manners. And what do we lack uh, still is a final deal comprehensive legally binding agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, which would solve each and every issue between uh, both countries and would uh, let both countries to move towards uh, European and Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. Uh, in the case of Serbia, if Serbia is willing to uh, a move towards uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, integration. As to this period, 2008 and 2020, uh, as I mentioned, I do analyze only normative impact. And uh, in this respect, uh, I do find same results as in the uh, independence uh, uh, period. So even that, EU was basically the main or the key actor in the terrain uh, in the second period via overs and transference diffusion. The results regarding normative impact remain almost the same as in the pre independent period with uh, some progress in some fields, but uh, uh, if we do uh, analyze and uh, generate results based on the analytical framework, the results would still remain uh, the same. And uh, this is mainly linked with the fact that the EU uh, could not find a common denominator or to speak with a single voice regarding recognition of Kosovo independence, which has undermine its conditionality mechanism in the terrain because five member states of the European Union still do not recognize Kosovo's uh, independence. So regarding 2008-2020, the EU was the main or primary uh, actor via overt and uh, transference uh, diffusion. Now some uh, concluding uh, remarks of the book and uh, of course uh, prospects for the uh, EU as a state builder in international affairs and also the uh, uh, prospects for uh, the uh, region of the Western Balkans in its entirety and uh, for uh, Kosovo in, uh, in particular. So, when it comes to the EU as a state builder uh, in international affairs, one may uh, highlight or summarize several elements which would make EU as an ideal state builder. For instance, by several uh, scholars, EU is considered as a 
country in Canada. So uh, it's a type of perpetual peace story uh, because in the last 70 years, we do not have a war or conflict uh, within the European territory. Now, of course, the case in, uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine uh, is another story, but still it's uh, beyond the borders of the um, uh, European Union. Then the EU, it has a normative ready-made framework which is quite uh, uh, useful to be applied in the uh, processes of uh, state building everywhere in the world. And uh, of course, uh, features such as sustainable peace, human rights, uh, then uh, rule of law, uh, free market economy are essential for uh, promoting the transformation of uh, various post-conflict societies and countries. So, uh, EU has all such features and elements. Then we do have the transformation of transformative power of the European Union in the Central and Eastern European countries. So um, basically, uh, 10 countries from the Central and Eastern Europe joined EU uh, in 2004, and uh, this was followed to two additional countries, Bulgaria and Romania in 2007. And in a way, it has transformed those countries, the European membership, it has transformed those countries. Uh, similarly, another feature or element of the new state builder in international affairs is its economic potential, economic uh, uh, power. Then EU per se is a project which is based on peace reconciliation and uh, uh, integration uh, based on norms and, and values. Uh, so basically, one would expect uh, huge results. Also, in the case of, uh, of Kosovo, uh, regarding the transformative power of the, of the EU and its role in the, in the state building process. Uh, however, what we're trying to related or regarding the case of Kosovo, there are at least two types of challenges uh, which EU needs to address in order to uh, generate complete successful results, not only in Kosovo, but in the entire region of the Western Balkans. Uh, the first type of um, challenges is related to horizontal conflicts between member states of the of European Union. Basically, as in the beginning of the uh, collapse of the uh, socialist federal republic of Yugoslavia, when EU uh, failed in a way to uh, find a uh, peaceful uh, solution for the dissolution process of uh, former Yugoslavia, Similarly, in the subsequent stages, uh, the EU has failed to find a common voice uh, between its member states regarding uh, the issues in entire former Yugoslavia, but in Kosovo in uh, particular. Uh, so even in launching and deploying its mission for, of rule of law, EU left, EU has encountered problems to find a common solution. And the main problem was also linked with the uh, non recognition by five EU member states of Kosovo's uh, uh, independence. So uh, basically, uh, the EU was able to find the lowest common denominator, how it is quite famously used in the uh, uh, foreign policy uh, structures and mechanisms of the European Union for the lowest common denominator in the case of Kosovo was we agree to uh, disagree. And uh, uh, we had uh, 22 uh, recognitions, basically when uh, UK, Great Britain was part of uh, EU, we had 23, but five non-recognitions which still continue to persist. And without having a common position uh, in the case of Kosovo regarding its statehood, the EU has failed to diffuse 
successfully the norms, you know, in order to reach complete success. Uh, as I said, it has reached some mixed results, relative success in diffusing norms in the case of Kosovo, but uh, the main obstacle in this sense was the lack of common policy in the case of Kosovo. This is the first type of challenges that I have identified in my book. So, horizontal uh, conflict between member states of the European Union. The second type of uh, challenge is uh, quite interesting one, but uh, it had its impact because we are talking here about norm and value diffusion. And it has to do with staffing problems. So the missions of the European Union, various missions, uh, even those in the pre-independence period or even those in the post-independence period, encountered challenges regarding staffing problems. And those staffing problems were associated with two types of, uh, of challenges. The first one, corruption challenges within the EU staff. And the second one, with the lack of results in the work of the EU officials in the terrain. Uh, I do mention in the book uh, several such cases, but in order to illustrate here uh, as a context, I will mention uh, two examples. One in the pre-independence period and the second one in the post-independence period. Uh, in the pre-independence period, um, we had EU pillar, which was a structure within UNMIC administration, but which was led by the EU officials always. And EU pillar within UNMIC was responsible to manage Kosovo Energy Corporation. And the manager of Kosovo Energy Corporation in the pre-independence period was always an international official. And one of those international officials was uh, Joe Trashler, a uh, German guy, uh, who was, but from EU member state, you know, uh, maybe there's no uh, importance to highlight his, his nationality, but uh, he was called back in his country for corruption for three or three point million euro during his work uh, of managing the Kosovo uh, Energy Corporation and uh, those money were uh, caught and uh, written back. But when we are speaking about known diffusion, uh, this is an example, a model, you know, uh, it is not a model which was providing the complete picture of the EU or international community, but still it is there. It has left its, uh, its track. So uh, this is one problem. Uh, this is one example uh, in the pre-independence period. On the other hand, in the post-independence period, we can mention several uh, examples uh, which were problematic um, with the eu led mission so with the eu mission of the rule of law uh, let me uh, illustrate here with uh, two examples uh, the first one was um, back in 2010 2011 uh, when uh, some romanian police officials, which were part of the eu led mission, were caught in the border between Kosovo and North Macedonia, like smuggling cigarettes and uh, alcohol. So again, this is not what the EU has provided in its entirety, but this is an example. Those were uh, EU officials and uh, they uh, uh, they have acted, of course, then they have uh, discharged by the uh, head of the UNEX, but still there is an example of uh, uh, norm diffusion in a way. And uh, also another example is with uh, EULEX judges and prosecutors, um, several scholars and authors uh, in the field highlight that, uh, for instance, prosecutors and judges from Central and Eastern European countries 
were showing up to work in Kosovo because uh, they were being paid more in Kosovo rather than uh, back in their uh, home country. So rather than uh, coming and showing up in uh, diffusing norms, one might raise the question if uh, this was linked with their uh, uh, level of, of, uh, of salary. So uh, those are examples which undermine, you know, link to the second challenge, staffing problems of the uh, EU institutions and agencies in the uh, terrain. Uh, so um, now, uh, because uh, I need to, to wrap up to finish in five minutes my uh, uh, presentation, uh, some concluding, uh, final concluding remarks and uh, 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 prospects additional to what I just um, said previously. So in order for EU to be successful uh, in uh, transforming Kosovo and transforming the, the entire region of the Western Balkans, uh, first EU needs to solve uh, its horizontal concepts. So the EU 25 versus EU 5. Uh, in other words, um, if the EU will not be able to solve those conflicts, horizontal conflicts between uh, member states, then I think that uh, we would need a more proactive role of other international actors in order to solve uh, the problems and the challenges that we to in Kosovo, but also between Kosovo and Serbia and in the entire region of the uh, Western Balkans. And of course, uh, when I say uh, in Kosovo and uh, uh, in relations between Kosovo and Serbia and the entire uh, region of the Western Balkans, when I refer to other international actors, here I have the mind also uh, United States, but also uh, United Kingdom, which uh, uh, British government, in other words, uh, which has appointed, you know, a special envoy for the uh, Western Balkans, like uh, some other countries did uh, act similarly in the uh, last few uh, months. So if the EU is not capable to solve as an entity the challenges that do exist in the region of the Western Balkans, then that gap, that vacuum needs to be filled in by uh, other international actors. And it would be uh, much better if that gap would be filled in by Western actors rather than um, actors such as um, Russia, China, and uh, any other alternative, uh, alternative actors. So basically the uh, case uh, of Kosovo will illustrate for the EU if the EU has learned its lessons uh, from the past, from the 1990s, or uh, it hasn't learned yet. Uh, this will be seen, of course, um, uh, in the upcoming month and uh, uh, a few years eventually. Uh, the final chapter of uh, state building in Kosovo and the role of the EU, US, and other international actors remain an open book in a way. And this includes the rest of the uh, uh, Western Balkans. Perhaps the idea of member state building, which was applicable in the case of Central and Eastern European countries, could also be relevant in the case of Kosovo, Serbia, and uh, other Western Balkan countries. Um, the EU accession process, I think, it needs to be uh, in the Western Balkans. It needs to be a process which would include all six Western Balkan countries together. If one or two of them join uh, in advance and the rest would remain uh, without joining the EU, then this process uh, would suffer for years or, or, or decades. And of course, uh, the EU's success or uh, failure in Kosovo and wider in the Western Balkans is one of the crucial tests of the European Union in international uh, affairs. Of course, in the regional context, 
the EU's litmus test in Kosovo relate to its role in achieving sustainable peace and prosperity, not only in Kosovo, but in the entire Western Balkans. And with this note, uh, I uh, end up here for the time being, and uh, I'm more than happy to see your comments and uh, questions. Thanks a lot for your questions and uh, attending my uh, presentation. Thank you. Now, um, as in your book, you've given us a very broad, sweeping uh, presentation. We're going to invite now uh, Alina to offer her observations. So over to you. I hope you've been able to hear us well enough in this uh, presentation. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, actually, to be part of this panel discussion on a very interesting book with CISOX community. Uh, always thrilled to be part of the team and hope to join there soon at the European uh, Study Center on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Southeast Europe Studies at, at Oxford. In my role as the representative of the European University of Tirana, I would like to congratulate you all, often Julie and everyone, uh, for your inclusive approach and outstanding achievements in terms of activities and collaborations for the study of the region. So uh, without further ado, I would like to start my discussion by um, um, on the book, uh, on the very important book uh, uh, by uh, Labinot Grecevci, uh, by pointing out that the topic uh, regarding the international state building uh, in general, and the case of Kosovo specifically, uh, has generated quite an amount of scholarly articles and studies from different fields uh, related to foreign policy, uh, but also in other contexts such as human rights, global security, legal studies, political economy, post-conflict and peace studies, uh, even media studies, and so on and so forth. A uh, few of them are focused on the European Union role as an international global player related to the case of uh, Kosovo. The book by Labinot, uh, the European Union as a state builder in international affairs, the case of Kosovo, published in the Routledge series, uh, is one of them. Um, the author endeavors to assess the results of the state building mission of the EU in the case of Kosovo and by doing so sets out to evaluate the importance of Kosovo's intervention as a crucial point in international affairs and state building missions. Uh, there is now in place quite uh, a new global disorder, let's call it this way, uh, this way with the Russia-Ukraine war developing as we speak. Uh, that might constitute another turning point in international affairs. However, in the case of Kosovo, we already have a practice uh, that is carried out by the EU, other actors as well, the United Nations, United States and its allies, with a certain success, one would argue. Uh, indeed, in the past 25 years, the European Union has increasingly become involved in international state building operations especially in the Western Balkans, like in Kosovo, but also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia or elsewhere in the world, for the matter of fact. The reactions towards such interventions um, have been mixed with many contesting those international missions for lack of efficiency or fragmentation and lack of coherence, calling the liberal state building framework overall a policy blip that was always destined to fail and based on more of a naive ideal, uh, idealism rather than realistic prospects. I'm referring here to Florian Bieber, for example, one of the scholars. Uh, despite the criticism, it is, however, accepted that the state building paradigm continues to evolve and seems to have been gone through the development of a new pragmatist uh, consensus seeking to increasingly situate itself as part of domestic and uh, local processes, taking therefore a more human face in terms of sustainability and local legitimacy, rather than an externally led transformation. In the case of Kosovo, we can see that this paradigm is working. 
to my opinion. This is one of the reasons I think that the author of the book under discussion today evaluates the European Union state building project in the case of Kosovo rather favorably. Uh, he maps out the tangible and normative impacts of the international mission and calls it cautiously successful overall. Uh, his perspective is supported by evidence and is based on adequate scholarly literature, namely the liberal peace approach and the normative approach combined. His stance complies, therefore, with the first perspective of the liberal peace approach, supporting the liberal goals of uh, a democratic and neoliberal framework for peace in the spirit of the idea of uh, account of the perpetual peace, noting that the adherence towards a Pacific Union is a prerequisite uh, for this ideal of a democratic state building process to work. I broadly agree with his findings and his arguments, as the role of the EU has proved to be essential for the emergence of the state of Kosovo and its state building process in international affairs. Even though the international intervention approach from within the neoliberalism paradigm as a state project might have many flaws and have not always proven the most effective due to many factors also related to the global balance of power among states that are said to determine war and peace, the case of Kosovo and arguably that of other countries um, in the Balkans region have the prospects of a rather successful story overall. Furthermore, in uh, response to some criticism regarding the international state building role in Kosovo, I would like to argue that in the case of Kosovo, there has been a previous basis for statehood and working institutional frameworks in place. So it is not quite fair to deem Kosovo or other Western Balkan countries as failed states despite their problems. Historically speaking, Kosovo has always had that social basis for governing legitimacy, so one cannot call it a failed state from within, uh, as staffing critics often relate the so-called statehood failures to some intrinsic characteristics of those states, apart from international inadequate intervention. I would argue that this is not the case with Kosovo, which has covered by itself a wide range of institutional capacity uh, building measures, encompassing everything from the legal and political system to education, health and welfare. I would like also to mention that a strong element of national identity paired with a liberal spirit of its people and a Western affiliation in terms of cultural, social, but also democratic values and sentiments might have helped the process of international state building in the country. One should mention, for example, the fact that with Kosovo, we have a country in the region of the Western Balkans that has already set a tradition of free and fair elections where the results are not contested, as elsewhere in the region. This is complemented, of course, with a set of other achievements in terms of democratic values applying both internally in governmental terms and in the context of their foreign policies and international relations. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that despite the fact that the role of the EU as a state builder in the case of Kosovo has been subject to weaknesses of its uh, fragmentation from within the alliance, its role has however been crucial for the emergence of the state of Kosovo and later in terms of institutional building, but also in terms of immediate economic reconstruction and free market economy, as well as ethnic accommodation and overall, uh, overall results um, following here the findings of the author of uh, the book that we are discussing today. I would only have a suggestion related to the use of interviews collected during the author's field work that reportedly informed the book content in terms of method methodology of the, of the study. The fact that they remain anonymous uh, might be considered a limitation uh, uh, where transcripts of those interviews would have helped to openly grasp the views of those interviewed for the book. So I would like to open the conversation with this first remark and eventually invite the audience to join the discussion uh, in the question and answer se session. So um, I'm just going to leave it here for now. Thank you for your attention and congratulations, Navina, for your book. Thank you, Belina. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if 
to begin, if you would like to say anything in response, if there's anything. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Belina, for your comments. Uh, basically, related to the interviews, it was the uh, determination of those who were interviewed to remain anonymous. So uh, it was not up to me to decide if they would like to uh, show up their uh, names and uh, I simply respected their wish and determination. Okay. Very good. Well, um, an opportunity now for the audience, starting with um, David. And I just wanted to ask from a technical standpoint, if there are questions, can we encourage any of the um, online participants to put them into the chat? Uh, there's already two in the chat. They're already excellent. So no. you'll monitor those for us. <laughs> yeah, if you want me to read them out, or, yeah. Okay, we'll start first with uh, David. Well, thank you very much, both of you, very much for what you said. Very interesting. Uh, Lebanon, a question for you. I mean, towards the end of your talk, I think you were hit with some kind of reconstruction of something approaching the quiz. Um, I may be wrong in that, but that was my supposition. If that, my supposition is correct, I think it's a very good idea um, because it seems to me that the um, you know the EU has been stuck for ages now, 22 against five. Um, something like the quint might help the EU move forward. Um, I think the Americans should be involved. And actually, I like your idea that you try and keep the UK somewhere there, not least because it gets the UK out of the prison rut we're in and for playing a positive role in an area of the world we actually know quite a lot about. It. Um, so that, that's all positive, and I think the idea of using the quint for a wider role in the West Balkans is also a very good idea. Um, so the, all the, to quote the Lord Robertson from yesterday, that's the message of hope. Um, but uh, how do we get there? And so who, who do you think should run with the idea of reconstituting the quint so that it could actually play a really positive role in the area? Uh, thanks sir, for the comments and the question. Um, basically, uh, the quint continues to play its role in a way. However, uh, the process has uh, a different type of background. Uh, in 2010, after the International Court of Justice delivered its advisory opinion on Kosovo's independence, which uh, stated that Kosovo's independence is in line or is not against international law, the General Assembly of United Nations authorized European Union to facilitate a dialogue between uh, Kosovo and uh, Serbia. So the background of the current EU facilitated process goes back to the United Nations. And basically, the uh, head of uh, external relations or head of foreign policy within the European Union uh, who leads this process needs at the same time, at the end of the process, or it is supposed to deliver back to the General Assembly of the UN. Uh, so then the General Assembly of the UN would approve any eventual final deal between Kosovo and Serbia and this would also uh, change the current UN resolution, which is still in place, 1244, uh, with which resolution uh, ended the war uh, between NATO and uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, and then UNMIC mission was uh, established uh, in Kosovo. So this is the formal side of, of, the, of the process. Now, the practical or pragmatic side of the process it has to do with the facts and arguments which are tangible in the world, uh, because the uh, US has a special envoy for uh, Kosovo and the entire Western Balkans. Uh, United Kingdom has a special envoy recently for uh, Kosovo and the Western Balkans. Same thing is with Germany. Now Germany has a special envoy uh, for uh, relations between Kosovo and Serbia and the entire uh, Western Balkans. So those special envoys 
or visiting both Kosovo and Serbia in the last few months, uh, uh, several times. And uh, uh, what we see here, uh, we also uh, notice or uh, we can underline a type of important role of both Germany and France. It seems that there is a type of coordinated approach between Germany and France uh, to push forward this uh, process. So the dialogue process, because it seems that um, the power uh, that the EU institutions do have above both sides, Kosovo and Serbia, is not sufficient to uh, move the, you know, the process forward. So uh, we do see some signs that Quint, as an entity, may be revived per se in a way, because if all those uh, particular member states of the Quint are becoming more active and more active uh, in the recent months, uh, then this may uh, uh, lead us towards that direction. But still, uh, the EU cannot be uh, neglected, cannot be uh, undermined due to the uh, formal side of the, of the process which I uh, explained to you. So that's my answer. I don't know <laughs> if that's sufficient or... It seems to be a very good answer. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much for your... Perhaps I could just return to this question. So I also think we underestimate it's always this question of all America. America is there at the whole time. And the Biden, it's become much more present as you know later. And Arnold and his successor, they've made several joint visits, which were quite unprecedented for a long time. And we've got the Washington Agreement. We've got the Washington Agreement. And we may think of it, let's not underestimate what it meant at the time. And that's why I've also got that situation in this way. But I want to go back to your remarks about the EU created, constructed, and the creation. I would agree that. I don't think the EU has ever used its position to play its role effectively. But you're talking about the IBM and you're talking about the community of the association, which were part of the first agreement on the Kabyashta. She was had it in the yeah. I think we have to be very careful when we say what the EU has done. Because we do not know, and it's still, we do not know what went on. And the EU always argues that it only facilitates yes. what those two sides want. No limits for change. Yes. But we cannot go back and look and see. And it's it's a rather probably unusual situation that we have to work and we have to done to build up trust between the two sides between the South mm -hmm. and the Kosovo. I think we have to be Careful, especially in that first period. I'm probably really not sure how they give it to us. I think we can come with a better strategy. I think we have to be careful with the last words that we mm -hmm. No, uh, I. To, to, to some extent, uh, I share your, your view, so forth. I'm aware of the fact that um, uh, uh, it's up to both parties. To uh, provide the uh, inputs and uh, reaching agreements on various issues. And uh, I'm also aware of the fact that uh, uh, no minutes were kept during those, uh, uh, those meetings. But uh, what do I say and elaborate in my book uh, is the fact that those agreements which were released under the EU facilitation process and which were generated with EU's institutional logo as well. Um, 
in practical terms generated from problems and challenges. I mean, I can reiterate here the uh, association of, uh, issue. Uh, even nowadays, we don't know if uh, uh, that entity uh, would ever be established in Kosovo and if uh, that entity would be established in, in, in Kosovo, uh, if it would be like a non governmental organization or if it will be a type of uh, political entity which would establish in Kosovo the uh, third level of, of governance, in other words, the type of regional governance, uh, which would uh, definitely be uh, a type of nucleus like uh, uh, the Republic of Serbia within Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which would uh, make Kosovo state as um, uh, dysfunctional and uh, not capable to uh, function uh, properly in its uh, entire territory and uh, would uh, simply uh, uh, create uh, the new uh, Republic of Serbia within Kosovo, for which even the international community uh, uh, would not be ready, I guess, because uh, they should have learned uh, the lessons of the date and peace accords uh, and uh, um, you know what uh, was produced in Bosnia, and because even in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, as you, as you know, there were several attempts to uh, produce constitutional changes by the various international actors in the last uh, 15 years, but uh, the results uh, are lacking. So, uh, in this sense, but. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you you have a point on on, uh, on what you say regarding the input of uh, both parties, and uh, I do agree that uh, agreements are uh, part of the input of uh, of uh, both uh, uh, sides, Kosovo and then uh, Serbia. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't have two denominators for the same thing: the association and community or border and. Uh, and boundaries. That that was the only way how they could uh, reach, you know, uh, some type of uh, agreement. But the problem with those agreements uh, uh, comes when uh, uh, those agreements cannot be implemented into into practice. Of course, uh, some technical agreements were already implemented, and uh, that's uh, uh, useful, nice, and important. But uh, uh, is that enough? But the, the question is that enough to uh, move forward, you know, to uh, change the life of ordinary citizens in both countries. And that was also the goal of the UN uh, General Assembly Resolution. So the EU should facilitate this dialogue in order to uh, uh, engender a more prosperous life for uh, ordinary citizens of uh, uh, both countries. And uh, uh, what we see, you know, in, in practice, we do not see uh, uh, substantial progress in, in, in that uh, respect. Of course, uh, the, we do have, you know, the negative peace in a way between Kosovo and Serbia. And, uh, uh, more uh, relaxed relations, but still, you know, uh, if we intend for uh, uh, a more uh, progress uh, with to open the doors for tangible and uh, concrete uh, uh, European integration process, in particular for Kosovo, because Serbia is moving on in that direction in a way. And also for uh, your Atlantic integration to uh, Kosovo, uh, we would need to have a final deal, legally binding agreement, uh, which would solve each and every issue between uh, Kosovo and uh, Serbia. I don't know, I see we have, I can't tell if it's five or I don't know if the people using the chat on the QA, but um, we'll take maybe some questions online. 
Um, if I can read this, um, is it correct to describe Kosovo as an EU NATO protectorate? To what extent is the legal and constitutional input into its governance a product of Kosovo, Kosovo political culture and practice? Uh, and um, why don't you take that? Question. Yeah, I can. First, yeah, yeah and um, actually, there are two from the same person. <laughs> uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so why don't we start uh, with that and we'll come back to the Quint with the second one. So, I guess it's a question yeah. of um, the um, yeah, extent to which um, EU NATO have been responsible for. I mean, uh, yeah, because I do not describe uh, in my book Kosovo as an EU or NATO protectorate, so, so let me first explain this. And uh, yeah, uh, to what extent is the legal and constitutional input in, uh, in its government the product of Kosovo political culture? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, uh, as in each and every country around the world, the political culture level of development of political culture or uh, it's also part of its uh, institutional structures and uh, set up so even in the case of Kosovo uh, this is not an uh, exception so uh, I mean uh, definitely the level of uh, development of political culture in Kosovo is also part of Kosovo's uh, institutional structures and uh, uh, set up. Uh, however, the way of framing uh, of institutional uh, framework and institutional structures in Kosovo was uh, mainly uh, led by the uh, international uh, actors. Of course, um, uh, the Kosovo political parties and civil society organizations had their say uh, during that. Uh, uh, process, but uh, there were cases when uh, there was no agreement, and at the end of the day, special representative of the Secretary General of the UN in pre independence period would say enough is enough, and he would uh, uh, determine the way forward without uh, uh, asking uh, what uh, local actors would uh, uh, say for a certain issue. I can illustrate with an example. It was constitutional framework in 2001, which was basically thought to be Kosovo's constitution. And uh, um, some of the main political parties uh, in uh, Kosovo would not agree with the draft of that constitutional framework, and they preferred to be called Kosovo's constitution and not constitutional framework. And uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, the special representative of Secretary General, who at that time was uh, Danish uh, Foreign Minister Hans Hacker, uh, he said that uh, this is enough. Uh, we will move forward without uh, asking you if you like it or not, and we will dub it as constitutional framework. And he uh, just continued with that. He uh, uh, promoted the first parliamentary election in Kosovo and uh, the rest uh, of the political parties and other structures uh, and organizations in Kosovo just had to follow the order of the king. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, that's my answer related to the uh, first um, and uh, we... departure from the EU. Yeah, we come back to the second question now but let me come back to this discussion we had earlier about the, the quint in britain um uh, has britain's departure from the eu reduced its influence in the quint um or one might even say in the western balkans generally given the importance of the role of the, of the eu there but um uh, william is asking specifically about the quint and with the Kosovan government so if britain had um in a less influential position now, having left the EU as far as diplomacy in the region is concerned. Um, regarding Quint, I don't think so, because uh, whenever Quint, you know, has a meeting between ambassadors of uh, the members of the Quint in Kosovo, UK is threatened also 
I do not see any uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, influence in that respect within Queen. On the other hand, uh, regarding the influence of uh, UK in Kosovo and the Western Balkans by not being part of the EU, it may be uh, something the opposite because uh, by not being part of the EU, UK may use its uh, uh, independent uh, status and role to um, move its uh, 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 to move its uh, uh, policies towards Kosovo and Western Balkans uh, independently from the EU. But uh, I'm uh, uh, quite uh, um sure to some extent that the uh, UK is coordinating its uh, uh, policies uh, together with the uh, European Union uh, regarding uh, not only Kosovo but the uh, entire Western Balkans. But uh, I think that uh, by uh, Brexit, the, more, the role of the UK can be more visible in a way in Kosovo and the Western Balkans rather than being part of the uh, EU. So, so just to, if I can follow on that, is there any sense that um, Britain is so preoccupied now with uh, negotiations with the EU, which has really put it at odds um, because of the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, does, does that if not diminish maybe its influence, but diminish um, the importance of the region for maybe both the EU and especially for Britain. I mean, it has limited uh, energy, limited capacity to direct itself towards uh, issues. Of course, there's even obviously Ukraine now, which is um, absorbing an enormous amount of its uh, attention. But does does the fact that it's uh, in a way at odds with the EU, even if they have permanent Common purposes, common objectives. Does that um, diminish uh, the, the capacity to influence developments in the region? Yeah, uh, capacity. If we link it to the uh, current war between Russia and Ukraine, then uh, if we see it from that perspective, you may have right on that direction. However, I can uh, provide the fact argument here that, for instance, uh, uh, previously to the uh, Brexit, when uh, Britain was part of the European Union, uh, we did not have a special envoy for the Western Balkans. Now, uh, now uh, that Brexit has uh, happened, uh, uh, you do have a special envoy for the, the Western Balkans and. Uh, he also had a tour around the Western Balkans countries, and uh, he had very uh, important and uh, relevant meetings with the uh, stakeholders in the region. So uh, I'm afraid I cannot say that uh, uh, the role of uh, Britain was uh, undermined in the region of the Western Balkans by uh, um, having the, the Brexit uh, into play. Well, then, you know, thank you, Robin McCulloch. Um, working hard lot in the region post uh, it was always my hope then that, which I think has not been realized, uh, with that we uh, would use not only the soft power, but also take an interest in these emerging economies, development economies, um, and basically engage in trade relations. I'd always seen that as one way in which you could take an active and hopefully healthy interest in the region. I don't see that happening at the moment. Whether it's post um, Brexit exhaustion or a general, as I detected in David's comment, a general withdrawal from engagement with Europe, I long in EU Europe. But I have to say, I would like to be optimistic that this would develop, but I don't see it at, at the moment. 
Um, so I fear that the Brit will may be willing to intermediate in theory, but bluntly is not prepared to do the detailed on trademark. Maybe that you are more optimistic, perhaps. Well, I don't see it at the moment. Oh, Sorry, could you summarize the question for the online audience? Because they can't hear it very well. For either of you, if you could summarize mm -hmm. the question. The question that um, you, um, Robin has has uh, just just asked about the there having been um, in Robin's estimate the uh, prospect greater um, opportunity that hasn't been seized. For enhancement of trade relations, relations between um, Kosovo and Europe more widely, would you say, or more the world in particular? Yeah, I was thinking of the possible role of Britain in trade. So Britain and uh, and Kosovo, and that that just doesn't seem to have been realized. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you said that I may be. Uh, more optimistic. In fact, I try to be realistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, the thing here with the trade relations, for instance, um, there are other European countries which have developed uh, quite substantial trade relations, not only perhaps with Kosovo, but for instance, Germany and Serbia, yeah. uh, they have quite uh, strong and substantial trade. Uh, Relation. When it comes to Britain, uh, I agree with you. You know uh, that uh, um, there is not so much uh, exchange of, uh, of trade uh, uh, partners and relations between uh, Britain and uh, uh, the Western Balkans. But uh, uh, I think one of the uh, issues, you know, that keeps uh, uh, investors. Um, uh, Skeptical about investing not only in Kosovo but the, in the entire region is linked with the um, issue of uh, stability paradigm, you know, or because uh, more or less the uh, international community uh, was interested to uh, uh, implement into practice to carry out this stability paradigm uh, instead of uh, investing and. Uh, developing Kosovo and the entire region. Uh, once you have legal issues, then lack of uh, political stability uh, in, uh, in those countries, uh, not only in Kosovo, but in other Western Balkan countries, then uh, uh, investors from uh, Great Britain may prefer to invest uh, somewhere else where uh, there is uh, uh, political stability and also uh, there are no unsettled legal issues. So uh, I think this could be one of the uh, reasons or factors that may explain you know, the lack of interest, if we may put it like that, you know, uh, from the uh, investors uh, from Great Britain to uh, invest in the and region. I know that there were some uh, attempts, you know, to uh, invest not only in Kosovo but uh, uh, in the entire region. But uh, if we compare, you know, with Germany, then uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, still Britain would uh, remain behind. And Slovenia, Croatia have done relatively mm -hmm. right. speaking in this regard. Do we have more questions on the? Q and A now. Uh, no. I see. Okay. Oh, the chat. Oh, the chat. Those aren't questions. Those aren't questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, please.
in the Western Balkan region. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So the EU global strategy yeah. and its um, principle, guiding principle of, of putting yeah. 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 Um, uh, has, has, has this also in a way diminished you know, the capacity for the um, EU to play a more effective role in the um, in the region because of the emphasis on regional stability over democracy building of opposition. Yeah, I mean, uh, that goes back to uh, what I have uh, said mentioned, you know, uh, previously, the lowest common uh, denominator. That's one side, you know, that you cannot find uh, common policies uh, related to the region, and it finds the lowest uh, uh, common denominator, and this ends up in pragmatism. You know? And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the stability paradigm uh, in the uh, region of the Western Balkans, uh, it has been implemented continuously uh, in the region since 1999, because, uh, of course, it is uh, essential to not have another world war in the region and uh, it is important first to have stability uh, and then to uh, promote democracy and uh, other uh, uh, essential associated elements with, uh, with democracy. So uh, in this sense, uh, the, the EU uh, has acted as it has acted, but uh, definitely, of course, uh, if you cannot promote um, certain common policies in the region, it will diminish or undermine the uh, credibility of the, of the EU. And um, I mean, regarding the case of Kosovo, for instance, visa liberalization, just to illustrate this uh, an example. Uh, uh, Kosovo remains the only country in the Western Balkans uh, for which EU cannot lift its visa regime. So, Kosovo government has fulfilled, you know, the criteria for uh, such a thing, and EU is not able and ready to uh, lift the uh, visa regime for Kosovo's uh, citizens since uh, 2016 or 17, when uh, the European Commission first confirmed that uh, Kosovo's government and institutions have fulfilled uh, all the necessary criteria for such a thing to happen in place. So, of course, now um, Kosovo citizens will not see with the same eyes uh, the US. Uh, uh, we have seen, for instance, in uh, 2016 and 17, because the EU was not a credible actor. It was not uh, ready to deliver uh, on its uh, promises. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. So um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Valina for serving as a uh, discussant, and especially to you, Lavinov, uh, for sharing the fruits of many years, I understand, of, of research uh, with us, and for having the uh, courage to expose yourself a very large uh, set of issues that you address. Uh, in the book, and I commend you for taking on such an ambitious uh, project, but it's been a pleasure to have you discuss your book with us today, so thank you very much. Maybe last words. Uh, thank you uh, again for uh, inviting me, and the pleasure was mine to have a, uh, such a fruitful discussion and debate with all of you. Thank you once again. Thank you.